We're going to be in Acts chapter 17 today. <clears throat> you know, prayer really does work. Prayer honestly does work big time. And even in worship this morning, we're worshiping and and to be perfectly honest with you, I'm I'm normally not somebody that's weighed down too much. Um, but just talking with Brittany and stuff on the way in, I'm like, man, I just feel it's heavy. You know, my heart's heavy. And and that's just not real typical for me. But in worship, we're worshiping and, and worshiping our Savior. And man, as soon as you can shift that focus to the Creator, uh, everything just seems to just... Pfft, Relax. You know, everything seems to be like, wow. All right. God puts things into perspective and lets us remember that this is just a, a season. It's just a moment. It's just here today. It's gone tomorrow. And He is the eternal. He is the everlasting God. He's all we need. And He truly does bring the beauty from the ashes. Um, and we, we're reminded of that time and time and time again in this word. So I just am so grateful for him. And it reminds me of, of the place in Revelation where it talks about our prayers and how our prayers rise up as, as a sweet aroma to him. And they, it gets mixed together in the mixing bowl of incense that, that rises up as this pleasing aroma to the Lord. And right there in the throne room, that's what's going on. And it says that an angel is stirring it together and that at the appointed time, God commands and it's cast down. The answers to those prayers are cast back down to heaven like lightning. It talks about Satan being cast out of heaven like lightning, but it also talks about our prayers that are answered, the prayers of the saints being answered in God's timing and cast back down to the earth rips and peals of thunder like it doesn't just do nothing it comes and it, it accomplishes the task and the purposes that God has for it and he requires us to pray he wants us to pray so that we can be part of that so I encourage you guys continue to pray um, pray for the things that are going on in your lives pray for the things that that are put on our prayer chain um, James and Chelsea just got back and and uh, they had a difficult situation. Um, her father passed away, um, but thank God that they're back safe and sound, and we've been praying for you guys. Um, Carol, how's your knee doing? It's great. Praise God. That's outstanding. Um, Ethan came back with uh, Lyle and Ashley, and, and his stuff seems to be doing pretty good. We're still praying for Denny, but... You know, there's always things to pray about. So I just encourage you, continue to pray. Continue to seek God's face. And also not just offer up the things that, that we need, which we are supposed to do that. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's extremely biblical, and Jesus lays out the path of how to do that. But also, praise Him. You know, give Him thanks and praise for the things that he has already done in our lives. If he never did anything else, wouldn't what he's already done actually, truly, if you think about it, be more than enough? It really would be. And he gives us the, the ability to still continue to pray, to still seek his face and watch him move. I just love that. All right, let's talk about um, Acts chapter 17 a little bit. I want to... Walk us through this chapter and point out some of the really neat things that God is doing with, with Paul and Silas and the people that are accompanying him as he's traveling around sharing the truth about Jesus Christ. When we start off in chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Ampiphilus and Apollonia. Yep, 
That's right. I said it right, probably. Probably not, but. And came to Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica. Where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service. And for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. It says that, that going to these synagogues, going to the churches, was his custom. This is just, as he goes into the cities, that's, that's what he does. He goes straight to the synagogues. Keeping in mind that all the Christian leader or all of the the godly leaders of these synagogues were the ones that have already beat him to a pulp, stoned him just recently to death, and he you know basically to death, and then he gets up. They they left him for dead because they they're like, yep, good enough. He's definitely dead, and they leave, and he gets up and goes back into that town. And so he's still, he's being led by the Lord in such a way. He has such a burden for these people, for the Jewish people, to come to know the truth about the Word, about the, the, uh, the law and the prophets. And these are God's chosen people, and he knows it. And God has put this burden in his heart so much so that he knows there's a real good chance while I'm doing this, while I'm proving this to them because God told me to, I'm going to die. The person that I'm telling them about, they already brutally murdered. He already knows I have brutally murdered people in the name of Jesus. Paul has before his conversion. Guys, this is, this is insane. This is extremely intense. And he goes into these towns and now he gets into Thessalonica where it goes into the Jewish synagogues and he proves to them through their scrolls, through their scriptures, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He proves it beyond the shadow of a doubt. But they were looking for a different type of Messiah. They weren't looking for Jesus to come in the way that he came. They didn't want to believe that he was born of a virgin, that he died, brutally died, that he had to die and then be raised from the dead. They would rather continue to believe that it's going to look like something other than what they think that it's going to look like. And he proves it to them. And a lot of people actually start to believe. It says that he said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. And we sit here and we think, well, okay, is that that big of a deal? These Jewish people were under extreme oppression from the Roman government extreme oppression. The only hope that they had was what the Scripture said about the Messiah to come that's going to set them free, that's going to sit on David's throne for all eternity. They're hoping for this, this Messiah to completely relieve them from the oppression, the governmental oppression that, that's been on their, their lives for so long. But Jesus didn't fashion this huge army. He didn't come in the glory that they thought that he was going to come in, triumphing and just wiping out all the Roman uh, armies and, and, and all of the enemies of the Jewish people. But he really did. He really did come, and he really did set them free. He really did remove their oppression, not their physical oppression, but their spiritual oppression. And some people saw that, but some people didn't see that. And that's why it was so difficult for anybody that was preaching the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, to anybody then, because they're looking for this, this physical release. It says, Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But some of the Jews were jealous. So they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. Notice what caused them to do this was jealousy. Jealousy is such a 
sick disease. I think that it's a disease. It's something that, that penetrates into people because they want to be the one in the spotlight. They want everybody to come to them, listen to them, uh, feel like that they have all the right answers. And whenever people start going other places, following other people, that makes them very upset. So it says that they formed a mob and started a riot. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury said, he said this quote, he said, when I go to places, people throw a tea party for me. When Paul went places, they threw a riot. And I think the Archbishop was thinking, am I doing things right or not? You know, because everybody's welcoming me. If, if, if my message is always welcome to everybody, guys, then I'm probably not doing things right. I'm probably trying to appease people and build a following. It's not about people following me. It's about people following Jesus. And sometimes that's going to cause riots because people want to have their own little way and do their own little thing. And whenever people present anything that's going to be in opposition to that, man, it's going to cause some problems. When... When I go places, people throw me a tea party. When he went, they threw a riot. Love that. All right. It says, They attacked the homes of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas, so they could drag them out to the crowd. They knew this is where these guys are staying. Hey, hey, they're staying over at Jason's house. Let's go find them over there. They're not there, so they drag this dude out, and probably everybody else that was with him. They drag him out, bring him into this makeshift court, and they try to bring charges against him. Listen to what it says here. It says, not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted. This has just got to be complete chaos. They shouted, and now they're here disturbing our city too. And Jason was welcomed. Uh, Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are guilty of treason against Caesar. This is the only time Jewish people are going to stand up for Caesar's, you know, good name in any means. It says that they're guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. So the people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into, a, into turmoil, turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond, and then they released them. Doesn't that sound just like our, our government today? I don't care what they're doing. As long as you guys pay me some money, you're going to have to post bond. These charges are absolutely bogus. There's nothing but since we've got you here and you're arrested already, you got to pay to get out. I'm not saying that it's always like that. It was certainly like that here, and sometimes it may be like that these days. But I just found it so funny that they made him post bond, and this wasn't even the guys they were looking for. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It says, Paul and Silas, um, that very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. Now, Berea is a little bit different place. They go from Thessalonica to Berea, and it says, when they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue, going straight to the synagogue again. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the Scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to check the Word. We're supposed to actually go in and see if what's being taught is real, if it's truthful. That's what you should do whenever I'm up here or Rod's up here. Check the Word. Make sure that what we're saying is truthful. If something gives you a check in your spirit, check it out. If we're wrong, bring it to us. We'll talk about it. We'll, we'll figure it out together. But it says, they literally... We're searching the scriptures to make sure that what they were saying was true. And as a result, many, Jewish, uh, many Jews believed, 
as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. It's interesting that they keep throwing in the fact that the Jewish believers believed and many prominent Greek women and men. It, it lets us know that, one, they didn't just teach in the synagogues. They also kind of, they were in, affecting their area of influence wherever they went. But if they did only go in there, then that means that these Greek men and women were actually in the temple as well. And that's what got some people in a lot of trouble too in, in different towns. But it says, but when some Jews in Thessalonica heard that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there and stirred up trouble. It's like it wasn't good enough that they ran them out of their own town. They're going to go over to Berea and try to run them out of that town too. And it says, the believers acted at once and sent Paul to the coast, while Silas and Timothy remained behind. So Paul was kind of the head figure of this, this group. He was the one that everybody was seeing all the time. He was kind of the main focal point of... Um, of the aggression against these, these believers. And so they're like, hey, let's get Paul out of here. But they kept um, Timothy and Silas behind to be able to continue to the work that was going on. They kind of had to change some things up. And so what you see here is essentially like a shift. So they had their normal plan, what they always did, you know, they would go into the town, they'd go to the synagogues, they would teach, they'd preach and everything. Well, that was kind of their plan A. Now they're having to shift what they're doing and go to their plan B. They weren't, uh, they weren't really planning on doing this, but you know what? Things change. We've got to adapt and we've got to overcome with the circumstances and situations that we've got presented to ourselves. And so that's what they do here. They kind of shift to a plan B. Um, Paul changes his approach in his in the way that he does missions. And we have to also be willing to shift and change our approach as well to continue to forward the message of, of the good news of Jesus Christ, right? There may come times where we can't continue to get up here and come into this church building. We might have to go to just strictly home churches and small groups and stuff like that. Uh, we might have to start meeting in secret like they do in many places across the world today in fear for their, their safety or their freedom and all that. It says that those escorting Paul went with him all the way to Athens. Then they returned back to Berea with instructions from Paul for Silas and Timothy to hurry and join him. So he left them there with instructions already probably to continue to be able to strategically minister the, to the people in Berea. But then also, Berea wasn't very far from Thessalonica, and, and they would be sending people back into Thessalonica and being able to minister kind of covertly there as well. It doesn't say that right here, but if you, um, if you start to research and you're uh, looking into the different um, teachings from other uh, other historians and stuff, that's what they said that Silas and Timothy were doing at this point. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all those who happened to be there. I love this about Paul, man. Wherever he goes... He's preaching the Word of God. He's sharing his testimony about what God did to him and through him and for him and for them. He's sharing it everywhere because, not just because God has directed him to do it, but because God has changed him so much. He loves God. He loves Jesus. He's passionate about this because he knows without the full knowledge of Jesus Christ, these people are going to perish. They're not going to heaven. They're literally going to die, and they're going to hell. There's only two options. And it's, it's burning in him to do that. And remember, whenever he was uh, converted, God said that he, I must show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul knew that there was a lot that was going on that, that he would have to suffer, but it was more important to him that the good news got out and that, that it got shared. And look who, look who he decides to debate with, who he decides to speak with and, and talk with about it. It says, 
he had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. So Epicurean is, an Epicurean philosopher is someone who follows uh, Epicurus, and he was an ancient Greek teacher. Like that's, you've heard the term epic. Well, he, um, he would go around and teach his basically materialistic theories. That's what he would do. It was all about materialism. That's who this guy was. And then the Stoic philosophers, uh, where it says that he, he debated with the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers, the Stoics were the ones who basically showed absolutely no feeling. That's where we get the, um, the term, they were very Stoic. It doesn't matter what's going on, they're just this like emotionless type person. These are the people that he's, he's having these debates with and talking with and, and telling them about Jesus. And, and it says he also had the debate with them. And it says when he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? They called Paul a babbler. Like they weren't even understanding, they weren't grasping what he was trying to say. These, these people in Athens, literally, they were always trying to, to hear the new thing, to, to find out the new, the new way that people are thinking, the new uh, concepts that people are talking about. And whenever Paul brings the message of the gospel, you know, we think Paul is this very eloquent, uh, very well-worded, well-spoken person, but this shows us exactly what people thought. Whenever he came and started talking, they thought that he was a babbler, that he wasn't making any sense whatsoever to them. And they believed some pretty weird junk, like really, really, really weird stuff. It says, others says, um, others said, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. So he's hearing this, and as, as Paul's hearing this, he's starting to realize that he has to shift what he's not what he's saying, but how he's saying it, right? So he's having to, right at this point, he's having to do what, what missionaries all across the world have to do all the time. And anybody that goes out and does any kind of street evangelism, if you want to be effective, you've got to be able to prevent, present the information in a way that the people that you're talking to can understand it and perceive it, whether that's culturally or... Um, you know, the age differences and things like that, you've got to be able to present things in a way that they're going to truly understand so that it will impact them, right? And the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, but, but Paul starts to um, do something called contextualization at this point. It says, They took him to the high council of the city, and they said, Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. <clears throat> it should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. So as they're bringing him up there, they're like, we want to hear some more about this, but I'm going to bring you into the council where you're going to have a bigger audience, and we're really going to try to find out what this is, what this is all about. It says, so Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. He says, men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. You know, people try to pride themselves on being religious. That's the great thing about Christianity. It takes the religion out of it, and it makes it a relationship with Jesus. It's not about the religion aspect of it. It's about the relationship. It says, they said, for as, or Paul said, For as I was walking along, I saw many of your shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it. It said, To an unknown God. Somebody literally made a shrine that you go and worship at to some God that they know nothing about. To this unknown God. To us, that doesn't make any sense at all, does it? But Athens followed all kinds of gods. There was tons of different gods. Like anything you wanted to try to follow, you could follow in Athens. Unless it was Jesus, of course. 
to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. It says, He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since He is Lord of heaven and earth, He doesn't live in, a man -made, in man made temples. And human hands can't serve His needs. For He has no needs. He Himself gives life and breath to everything, and He satisfies every need. From one man, He created all nations throughout the whole world, throughout the whole earth. And He decided beforehand when they should rise and when they should fall, and He determined their boundaries. His purpose was for nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him, though He is not far from any of us. For in Him we live and move and exist, and some manuscripts say, and have our being. As some of your own poets have said this, we are His offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. So let me, let me hit something real quick here. I've read through this multiple times. We've all heard this taught multiple times, right? That through Him we live and, and have our being and, our, and we exist through Him. Well, where it says, as some of your own poets have said, I was talking with Brittany about this. She did a whole um, uh, verse study on this. But this is actually, he is quoting one of their poets that first penned that about Zeus, about a foreign god. I was like, wow, that's pretty wild. You know, I mean, it's such an impactful statement but if you think about it, God is the one that has created us. He's created us to be creative beings. He, and it's interesting how this poet writes this about Zeus, this fake God. But Zeus and in, uh, the Greek philosophy and stuff, they believe that he was like the main God, you know? But Paul takes that same thing and says, no, what they've said about your fake God is true about the real God, about the God that truly did create everything, even you, even the breath that you have, the air that you can breathe. The one true living God is the one that this should actually be attributed to. It says, for in Him we live and we move and we exist, guys, because we can't live, we can't move, we can't exist without our one true God. You know, this, as we're going through chapter 17, and, and we, we think about where Paul had just came from, and the fact that he's having all these conversations Remember just one chapter earlier, in chapter 16, whenever Paul and Silas were imprisoned, and then there was an earthquake, and all the chains fall off, and, and their jailer is so afraid that all the prisoners have, have broken out, he knows that, that that's a, a, a situation that's going to get him killed. Being in charge of these prisoners, if they get away, that's punishable by death, and he will be killed for it, and it was the death that he was going to be looking at was so gruesome that it was more feasible for him to take his sword and literally kill himself than, pun than deal with the punishment that was going to come from the government for letting them go. And Paul and Silas, they cry out and they're like, stop, 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 stop. We're still here. They stayed in the prison, in the dungeons, and told him not to kill himself because of the love that God had put in their heart, even for that guy. And what they did literally caused him to have such compassion and mercy and want to know and understand, who is this God that you serve? This is incredible. And so he takes them, he gets saved, he bought, um, cleans them up, bandages their wounds and all that stuff, takes them overnight and, and is loving on them and caring for them. And his whole life was changed because of their actions. But his actions that got him in that prison are the same actions that he's having right now. These conversations that he's having with these, these people right now, he's going to be going, could very potentially be going back to prison or, you know, beat or stoned or 
or whipped, all that stuff. I, th I just think that's absolutely wild. But this, um, at this point where he's talking to these people about even your poet and what he wrote is actually about the true God. He's, he's presenting the facts that they, they believe to be true in a whole different way that's actually going to bring about their understanding of who the true God is in, in uh, Jesus Christ. It says, and since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. And I know, guys, this seems absolutely ridiculous that people would actually fashion things themselves. That's like, Steve, that's like you going in and, and worshiping a sheetrock job that you just completed because it looked really good. You know what I mean? Like, Bill, you built most of this building. That would be like you coming here and worshiping the building instead of the God. You know what I mean? It's just mind-blowing. What kind of sense does this make? But that's how they were raised. They were taught. They were trained. You know, And the enemy wants us to shift our focus onto anything other than the one true God. And he's telling them, look, you created this. You're so good. You can worship this thing. This is what you should worship. It's a, it's a piece of wood. <laughs> what? It's, a sto it's, it's just stone. It's something that somebody crafted and created. It's, it's just so ridiculous. Paul goes on, he says, But God overlooked people's ignorance about, this thing, about these things in earlier times. But now He commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to Him. Beforehand, they had a little bit of excuse because they, didn't, they might not have known Him. They didn't have the opportunity to know Him, so He had grace on them at that point in time. But now... He doesn't have grace on them because now they know the truth. And if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But if you ignore the truth and you refuse the truth and you don't want to actually go after God and you want to serve yourself or you want to serve your pleasures or you want to serve other gods or anything else that you put above Him and before Him, then you're going to suffer the consequences of that decision. That's the way it is. Because it's nonsense to serve anything other than the one true God. And He loves you and He designed you and created you for this relationship with Him. And that's the whole reason you were made. It says, For He has set a day for judging the world with justice. We don't want to believe that, that judgment is justice, do we? But it is justice. If somebody does something heinous against you that's horrible, hurts somebody you love or, or hurts you or whatever, you want justice, don't you? Well, God is bringing justice. He's, the day is coming for the world to be judged with justice by the man He has appointed and He proved to everyone who this is by the raising of Him from the dead. So He proved that Jesus is the one that He's talking about by raising Him from the dead. Remember whenever Jesus said, I have been given the authority by my Father to lay my life down and to take it up again. Jesus, while He was walking on the earth, He raised people from the dead, multiple people. They were dead, no doubt about it, they were dead. Some of them were literally even in the grave already, had been buried, and He raises them from the dead. That is spectacular. People were getting healed, blind people were being able to see, people that couldn't walk could walk. Those are great. Deaf people can now hear. That's great. But does that compare to somebody being dead and then come back to life? I mean, there, there's a difference there. In my mind, there's a difference. But just as there's a difference between somebody being physically healed while they're alive and a dead person being raised from the dead, there's a huge difference when the dead person raises themselves from the dead. That's, that's major. That is, I mean, how do you wrap your mind around that? But Jesus says, the Word tells us that the same Spirit 
that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us, can live in us, if we ask him to. That's the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can be alive and well in us. We can harness that. We can live in Him and Him live in us. We can literally walk with Him, talk with Him. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. That same Spirit, that's wild. I just love it. And that's how, Jesus, or that's how God the Father proved that Jesus is the Messiah by raising Him from the dead. He had been dead for three days. That's pretty wild. Lazarus was dead for four when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some people laughed in contempt. You know why? Because they weren't there and they didn't see it happen. Where do we live? Missouri. We're in Missouri, right? The show me state. You got to show me or I'm not going to believe it. They weren't there. But they heard people talking about it. They just didn't want to believe that it was true because they had never seen it done before. Nobody thought that, that a human being could break a four-minute mile, running a four-minute mile. It was like this inconceivable thing until one person did, and the whole world saw it, and then people started doing it all over the place, right? Same kind of thing. If people don't believe it, it's very hard to, to go over that crest. It says, when they heard Paul speak about the resurrection from the dead, some of them laughed in contempt, but others said... We want to hear more about this later. Like, we need to go eat lunch, but we want to hear more about this later. So you got to come back. That ended Paul's discussion with them. But some joined him and became believers. Among them were Dionysus, a member of the council, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So that's how chapter 17 wraps up. We have to understand, guys, that when we're sharing the gospel and when, when we're sharing what God has done in our lives and when we're sharing the truth about who the real God is, some people are going to listen. Some people are going to believe. Some people are going to want to hear more. Some people aren't. It's not your, it's not your responsibility. It's not a weight on your shoulders to make everybody want to listen and want to believe. It's just your responsibility to share it. Okay? So be willing to share it. You can change the world. You can change your area of influence as well, and you can impact people for the love of Jesus Christ. Does anybody have anything that they want to add? Or questions or comments? All right. Well love you guys very much. I hope that you're enjoying the, uh, the teaching on the book of Acts. And next week, Rod will be teaching on Acts chapter 18. That is next week, right? So definitely come back for that. Uh, we're going to close with a little bit of worship. If anybody has needs prayer for anything, please feel free to come up. Um, I would love it if uh, some of you would come up and pray for me and, and pray with me for my friend uh, that, that I'll be seeing this week. That would be great. But if you have need for anything else, um, come up. If you haven't uh, entered into a relationship with God and you want to and you feel that, that that's what He's calling you to do right now, come up. We'll help walk you through that. If you have kids in the nursery, don't forget to pick them up. And... I hope that you have a great weekend. Love you guys, and God bless you.